Hello everyone, I'm Chris Parker with parkerphotographic.com and this is the Lightroom Quick Start Guide for beginners who want to learn how to use, well, Lightroom. Now, before we get started, we first have to figure out which version of Lightroom that you're using and that's because Lightroom comes in three different flavors. Now, Lightroom Classic will have an interface that looks like this. And then we have Lightroom with a slightly different interface. And then of course, if you're using Lightroom on a smartphone or a tablet, then you're using Lightroom Mobile. Now, this quick start Lightroom tutorial series is going to focus on Lightroom Classic. If you're using one of the other two flavors of Lightroom, then check out the playlist in the description below to discover the Lightroom tutorial quick start guides for your version of Lightroom. Now, this quick start series will be divided into five small bite-sized tutorials, and I recommend going through each in sequential order to get the most out of Lightroom Classic. So what are you going to learn? Well, first, we're gonna start with a basic overview of Lightroom Classic. We're going to explore the interface to discover where everything is, how to customize the interface, and more. Now, after that, you're going to learn what a Lightroom catalog is and why you need it, and I'll show you how to import your images. Now, once you have your images imported into Lightroom Classic, you're gonna learn some tips for getting them organized. After that, you're going to learn how to edit your images. Now, once you're done doing all of that and you have all your edits done and you wanna share those images with the world, we're going to continue with exporting your images out of Lightroom so you can then share them with the world. This will be a quick overview of what Lightroom Classic is in this video tutorial. And we're also gonna have an introduction to the Lightroom catalog system and reviewing the Lightroom Classic interface so you know where everything is located and how to customize the interface. Now, if your version of Lightroom doesn't look like this, then you're using a different version of Lightroom. So check out the playlist in the description below to find the Lightroom tutorials for your version. So what exactly is Lightroom Classic? How does it work and how can you use it? In essence, Lightroom Classic is an editing and photo file management system. Now, it was designed specifically for use by photographers and it was created to help you streamline your workflow by allowing you to easily organize, edit, and share your photos. Now, for me, this was a life-changing application when I was running my wedding photography studio full-time back in 2008 when I started using the first version of Lightroom. It literally saved me days of work and it used to take at least a week to edit a thousand images with Photoshop and then once I developed a workflow with Lightroom Classic, I was able to cut the amount of editing time down to a few hours for the same amount of photos, but it wasn't just the speed of editing that was life-changing. It also allowed me to organize hundreds of thousands of images. And by doing so, I can find any photo I need within seconds. And this is possible based on the structure of Lightroom, which is essentially a database. When you start Lightroom for the first time, you must create a catalog that stores information about your individual photos. So when importing, you're not importing the actual files. Instead, it's a preview of what your photo looks like. Then when you add information to organize your images and any edits that you apply are stored in the catalog or as a separate file that is stored with the original raw file, which is known as an XMP file. So let me show you what that looks like. So this is the original raw file here and this file here next to it is the XMP file. Now, if I click and drag this down to a text editor and open it up, you will then see and find all the information about that file in regards to the edits that you applied and any metadata to organize that image like star ratings, labels, keywords, and more. So if I scroll down here, you can see I have some edit settings right here. We have white balance at custom, and then the white balance setting that I applied is this number right here. So the catalog is essential for organizing and storing your metadata without altering your original file. Now, for those that have just installed Lightroom Classic, you'll be presented with a screen that looks like this. And then to create a catalog, you're going to give it a name and choose a location where to store it. Now, for my catalogs, 
I store it with the primary location of my images, but you'll have to decide for yourself where you want to store that catalog. Now, once you have that created, you're going to be presented with the Lightroom Classic interface that looks like this now, except you're not gonna have any images in here, and we'll get to that in just a second. But first, let's take a look around the interface to discover where everything is located. All right, so the Lightroom Classic interface is divided up into five main sections. So up here at the top, we have our first one, the top panel and we have different categories up here. These are known as modules. So a library module, develop module, et cetera, or you can think of them like a page. Each one, when you navigate to that page or module, will give you different features and tools to do something with your images. So by default, the library module is the first place you're going to begin when you open up Lightroom. This is where you import your images, you're going to review your images, and you're going to organize them from here. In the develop module, this is where the magic happens. This is where you're going to edit your images. Next, we have the map module. Now, this is a place where you can sort your images based on a world map, and then you will see this little icon right here. It says 338. So that means I have 338 images in this location of the world, which is Letchworth State Park. Now I have thousands of images in this catalog, but that is the only area where I've placed images. Now, this can happen automatically if your smartphone or your DSLR has the capability to track or record geo data. If not, then you have to manually place this information or place your photos on the map. Next, we have a book module where you can create a book and then you can submit it to different vendors via these options here. You can also create a slideshow, which is going to take a minute to open up since I have 547 images presently selected for the slideshow. And then we have a print module where you can set up different parameters for printing your images, either on an in-home printer or a vendor of your choice. Now, the other thing that's pretty cool about the print module is you can include multiple images on a page if you need to print, let's say four, four by six prints or four, four by five prints on a sheet of paper, you can do that in the print module. You can also use it to create collages or Instagram stories or whatever the case may be. I used to use it for Facebook timeline covers as well because you can put multiple images in here. The least used module is the web module, which is going to take your images and create an HTML website once you upload it to a server. Now for all these modules, the only two that I really use are the library module and the develop module. So if you wanna hide these, you can by right clicking and then clicking on one of these items to show or hide that module. Now the text probably looks different than yours. I have a specific font and color that I'm using for these as well as this part over here. This is known as an identity plate. So if you right click on this, you can go in and you can customize your identity plate to add your name, a graphic, a logo, and also to choose different fonts for your top panel. All right, I'm gonna go back to the library module here and inside the middle is another section where you see the previews of your images in Lightroom Classic. Now from here, you have different views from this toolbar right here. Now, if you're not seeing this, press the letter T to hide or show it again. And then we have a lot of options down here to organize our images with star ratings, labels, flags, and then you can also change the view from a grid view to a single view. And you can also use these options here to compare images side by side when you're trying to decide which image you wanna keep and which one you wanna get rid of because maybe you took two photos and they're very similar to each other. You can do that with the compare modules right here or the compare icons right here. Now, on either side of the interface, we have two additional panels. Now, inside of these panels, we have additional panels. 
that will be visible once you click on it it will expand and show you that information so the left side here in the library module is going to allow you to locate the files within the catalog based on the folder system that you have set up because the folders will stay similar to what you have in your operating system when you import a folder then on the right side here we have some options for organizing our images some more with keywords. You can also do a quick develop on a specific image if you want to check out the exposure to see if something can be saved because maybe it was over or underexposed. You can do a quick edit from here. And we also have our histogram, which is nice to have to see if an image is over or underexposed as well. And there's a lot of other things that you can do here as well. Metadata being one of them. If you want to add copyright information, you can do that from here. All right. Now, as far as these panels go, left, right, top, and there's another one down here. This is the film strip down here. You can show and hide those panels as well. So if you click on this little arrow right here, or this little carrot, you can then close that tab or click to expand it. Now, if you hit your tab key, that will show and hide the left and right panels. You can also make them wider by clicking right here. Once you see that icon change, you can then click and drag to the left or to the right to make it wider or not as wide. Now down here, we can click here to drag up and make those thumbnails larger. Now, these panels are slightly different in the develop module because they're going to give you different tools to work with your images. So we have a navigator here and once you zoom in, actually, if I come over here, I can click on different zoom levels. I can then use the navigator to navigate around the image that way or I can just hit fit here to fit it back into the window. So right here, we have some presets that are included in Lightroom Classic. I have some free ones as well, which you can find on my website, and those will be located right here on the left side. We also have some additional things here to help us with our editing as well. And then on the right side, we have our histogram again, which I like to keep open so I can review that histogram as I'm editing because it's going to change its shape and I want to make sure that I have the full dynamic range of my image when I'm editing and I want to make sure I'm not clipping any information. We'll talk more about that in a future tutorial. Now down here we have a set of tools right here. These are known as local adjustment tools. So they're going to allow you to target specific areas of your image with the edits that you need to apply for that particular edit. Down here, we have more global edits. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's going to target the pixels in the entire image versus a local area. Again, we'll cover more of these in a future tutorial. Right now, what we need to do is figure out how to get our images into Lightroom Classic before we can begin editing and organizing them. And this is a deep dive into importing your images into Lightroom Classic. So you're gonna learn everything you need to know about getting your images inside of Lightroom, including tips for improving your productivity and speeding up Lightroom based on the selections you make. And then I'm gonna share some pro tips for organizing your images. So if you're ready, well, let's do it. All right, so to begin importing your images, you're gonna go up to the library module here and then down here and click on the import button. And then you're gonna be presented with this new window with three main columns. So on the left side is the source and that's where you're going to tell Lightroom to import the images from. The center will be a preview of those files. And then on the right side, you will have some options you can select before you import that can help you streamline your workflow and improve your productivity. So we're gonna go over all of these different panels as well as these four options up here, which are going to alter the options you will see visible over here on the right side. So let's go ahead and start with the source and dig a little deeper into the source section because there's something critical that you need to do before you begin importing your images. And that's creating a folder and file naming structure that you can utilize consistently as you work with Lightroom Classic. Because if you don't have a structure in place and you change a folder and or file name outside of Lightroom, you're going to create problems in Lightroom. Specifically, you're not going to be able to edit or organize your images if you change the name outside of Lightroom. So basically the source is telling Lightroom, okay, my images live exactly in this folder with this name and these are 
the file names. So there's a link between that folder and Lightroom. And if that link is broken because you changed the name, you won't be able to do anything in Lightroom until you relink all that information back into Lightroom. So let me give you a couple of options for a folder and file naming structure. So for this catalog here, my landscape and wildlife catalog, I created this a few months ago and I did a simple naming structure of locations for the folder names. And then inside the folder, I just have a specific number with the name of that location. So a very simple naming structure. Now, I did create a more complex naming structure for my wedding and portrait photography business. So let's take a look at that. So I have my master folder here and then inside, we can see I have three different folders plus my wedding catalog. So I have my portraits folder, my stock photos that I've created, and a weddings folder. Now inside the weddings folder, you're going to see different folders by year. And then inside of that, I have different folders for the name of the client, as well as additional folders inside of that, which are showing the type of file format in this case, DNG, and then tweaks, which are files that I did some creative edits to. And then I have a specific file naming structure for those. So you have to think about a naming structure you want to use for your workflow. And then you can begin importing your images, knowing that you're not going to have any problems in the future, unless of course, you do rename those files or folders, or if you move them to another location or hard drive. All right, so let's go back inside of the import dialog here and let's take a look at some of the other options. Now on the source side, Lightroom is going to recognize all the hard drives that are connected to your computer. So I have my internal drive up here plus three external drives that I can use as a source to import files from. Now, if I take my media card here and if I connect it to my computer, Lightroom is going to automatically detect that new device and then I can use that as a source to import files. Now at this time, all those files are grayed out and that's because these files have already been imported into Lightroom. Now if we come over here to file handling, there's an option that says don't import suspected duplicates. So if I turn this off, I can import those files again but I do recommend turning this on so you don't accidentally import duplicate files. Now, if for some reason you're not seeing any images or if Lightroom says no photos, that's because you need to turn on include subfolders if you're selecting a folder at the top of the hierarchy with one or more subfolders inside. So if I click on this folder here, it's gonna say no photos, but when I click on subfolders, it will find all the files in each of those subfolders. All right, so let's take a look at these four options up here, and the one you choose will be dependent on what works best for you and your workflow. Now, the first option here is copy as DNG. So what's going to happen is Lightroom is going to take the files inside of this folder, and it's going to create a DNG file of each of the original raw files, and import only the DNG file. So we need to tell Lightroom the destination where that DNG file should be created. And we need to click on destination here to select where Lightroom should copy those DNG files to. Now, if you're not familiar with DNG files, they are a file format that is different from the original raw file and they have advantages and disadvantages. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about that, let me know in the comments below. So the destination panel here has a few different options. So let's go over those. So the first option is to place them into a custom folder with a name of your choice. And you have some options to organize by folders or by date. So if you choose by original folders, that's gonna keep the same file structure that your original raw files are in. But if you choose by date, that's going to separate all the files into individual folders by date. So we can see we have 2022 here, there's 32 images and a bunch of different folders that are going to be created for each one of those files. Now, next to the folders here, we can see the number of images in each folder. And then down here at the bottom, we have 2023, 
with looks like two folders for that particular folder. Now, if you wanna change the date format for the naming of those folders, just come in here and click here, and then you can select a different format from here. Now, if you're not going to create a DNG file, you can copy the files from your source and place them into another destination. And those files that are copied will be imported into Lightroom. So the source could be an external hard drive and then the destination could be your internal hard drive. Now, the move option would just be taking the images from your external and moving them based on your destination and those files in that new location will be imported. Now, my preferred method is add and that's because based on my workflow, what works best for me is to take the images off the media card and place them directly on my internal hard drive in the location before I get into Lightroom. And then once I get into Lightroom, all I have to do is click on add and locate those files via the source. And then because I have add selected, two of those other options that we had before are no longer visible because we don't need to move or copy them based on this particular workflow. So let's take a look at these other two options here to get an idea of how this can improve your experience with Lightroom and make it more productive. Now, the other thing I wanna mention real quick is these other three options do include the file renaming panel here that we haven't talked about yet. So if you want to import and rename your files during the import process, you can do that from here, but it's not something that I do or recommend. What I like to do is I like to go through and find the keepers and the images that should never see the light of day and I'll reject those and then I will delete them from my computer and anything that is a keeper, I will then rename accordingly. All right, let's start with the file handling options here and there's quite a few to go over. So let's go over the building of previews first and the options for building previews can speed up reviewing your images in the library module and others. So there are four main types of previews that you can build during import. And remember, you're not importing the original raw file as we talked about in the previous tutorial. Instead, you're seeing a preview of the original, but we need to let Lightroom know what size of preview to create and each has its advantages and disadvantages. So the minimal preview is the smallest and fastest preview for Lightroom to create. So this means your images will be imported faster compared to the other options. However, keep in mind that the quality of these previews is not that good and will be best for viewing your images in the grid view. So if you want to review your images in loop view or zoom in, Lightroom will need to create a higher quality preview before you can view the fine details of your image. So let me show you what that looks like real quick. So I'm gonna go in here and this folder of images had minimal previews created during import. And if I click on this image and zoom in, you're going to notice that the image is pixelated. And before we can see the fine details, it takes a few seconds to do that. And sometimes you will see this loading bar down here at the bottom. And depending on the speed of your computer and the size of your files, this could take a couple of seconds to a few seconds or longer. So if that's something that you don't want to have happen, then you'll want to choose a higher quality preview. So the next option here, let's get back into the import dialog window here. So the next option is the embedded and sidecar previews. And this is gonna tell Lightroom Classic to use the JPEG preview built into the raw file if it exists. So if you want to import your images the fastest way possible that gives you a preview that's good enough to view in the library module, then go ahead and select this. All right, so next we have standard previews that will let you view photos in the loop view since they're of a higher quality, but they are not large enough for you to zoom into. So again, like minimal, Lightroom will need to create higher quality previews. Now, the best quality previews are one-to-one, -one, but they also take the longest to build, and it's going to take much longer for your images to import. Plus, 
the files are very large compared to the other three and it's going to take up a lot of hard drive space. Now, the benefit of these is not having to wait for Lightroom to load the new preview since it's already been created during import. So it's gonna be a lot faster to zoom into those types of previews. Okay, so the next type of preview is called a smart preview. And these allow you to work with your images in Lightroom Classic when the original raw files are missing. So remember earlier, I mentioned that Lightroom needs a link to the original raw files. And if you rename anything, that link is broken. You can also break that link if your raw files are on an external hard drive and you disconnect it. So let's say you're editing on a laptop and you go on vacation, but you forget your external hard drive. Well, if you have images on that drive and you wanted to work on them while traveling, well, you can't since the link is broken. However, if you create smart previews, Lightroom won't need that link to the external drive to be connected. So this means you'll be able to edit those files even though the link is broken. All right, so we've already talked about this option here and make a second copy to is available when you select one of these other three options up here. And that will basically allow you to create another copy if you wanna back up your files that way. And then add to collection is another way of organizing your images into virtual folders. And we'll talk more about that when we get into organizing your images. All right, so the next panel here, we have apply during import. And now these options are pretty cool. So we have develop settings here. And if you click on that, you're going to see a list of all your developed presets. And what you can do here is, let's say you have a specific preset that you like to add to all your images, or maybe a lot of images, maybe not all of them. Well, you can select that preset from here and it will be applied during import. That's pretty awesome if you ask me. Now, I like to do this for lens correction so I can fix lens distortion and chromatic aberrations during the import process. So that's one less thing I have to worry about doing during the editing process. Now, under that, we have a metadata preset and I have one here called Parker Photographic and this is my copyright preset. So if I edit that, let's take a look at that and I need to select it from up here. And if we scroll down, we can see my copyright information. So all that information is going to be included in the metadata of the files that are imported. And if you want to create one, just click on new, give it a name up here and then scroll down and include the information here that is in red. And then under that, we have a keywords box that will allow you to put in keywords to begin organizing your images. But I would recommend keeping those keywords to be more generic versus specific. So for this, I would do like location, season, or if I'm shooting one individual, I may put their name in there. If I have multiple types of subjects like I do in this folder here, I wouldn't want to put a monarch butterfly because that only applies to that one specific file here and that keyword will then be applied to all of them. So I would do the more specific keywords in the library module once they're imported inside. All right, so the last thing I want to show you is this option down here. It says import preset. So what you can do is you can take all these settings that you've selected and you can save it as a new preset, which would be helpful to you if you have multiple workflows. Let's say sometimes you want to create a DNG file, but other times you may not. Sometimes you may want to copy or move. Sometimes you may want minimal to get through the images faster to approve and reject images, or you may want to just start off with high quality images depending on the photo shoot. And instead of coming back in here and making all these selections and also different developed presets and different metadata presets, you can save them as a preset and then Lightroom will quickly update all the different settings based on that preset. All right, so once you have all your selections, you can begin importing. You're going to see this progress bar up here showing the progress of those previews being built. It could take a few seconds, a few minutes or more depending on the speed of your computer. Now that all your images are in Lightroom, you now need to organize your images. So you're going to learn some pro tips on getting your images sorted and ranked, how to add keywords, create virtual folders with collections and more. So if you're ready, let's do it. 
Now, once I've imported my images into Lightroom Classic, the next step is to begin the process of culling and sorting my images. So the goal is, is to discard the bad images and tag the keepers before I do anything else. This way, I'm not wasting time organizing images that will end up being deleted. So let's check out some images that I have here in this collection. I have 1,064 images and these were created over a couple of days in August and a couple more days in October. So during that trip, I took 1,064 images. However, if we take a look at my primary folder here, there's only 329 keepers. However, not all of those are original raw files. Some of them are additional file formats based on what I'm going to use those files for. And if I go up to the library filter here under text and I filter out just the NEF files, which are the original raw files, I'm left with 173 images out of 1064. So I rejected 90% of the images. So let me show you how I went about doing this. Now, my preferred method for culling, sorting, rating, and tagging images is to do so in loop view. So we can get to that with the letter E or come down here and click on this icon here. And this will show the image much larger one at a time. This way I can see much better which images are in focus and I can better see the lighting and the composition which will help me decide on whether or not I need to reject a photo or if maybe it's a keeper. So there's a few different things that I like to do. So let's go over those so you know how I do it and then you can decide for yourself what works best for you. So I like to apply the black flag which is a rejected tag. You can apply that by clicking on this flag right here or by pressing the letter X. Now, if you want to tag your images with a white flag, because maybe that is going to represent an image that is a keeper, you can do that by clicking on the white flag or pressing the letter P. Personally, I like to apply stars instead. So I'm gonna place my left hand over the letter X so I can keep it there as I scroll through the images with my arrow keys with my other hand. So if I find an image I want to reject, I'm gonna press the letter X and that's going to auto advance to the next image. However, you may not wanna do that depending on how you set up your workflow because if I tag this image with, let's say a white flag, and I also wanna add stars to it, well, it's already advanced. Now I have to go back and then apply those extra settings. So to turn on or turn off auto advance, you're gonna go up to photo and click right here. I'm gonna go ahead and keep that on because that's what I prefer for my workflow. All right, so for this particular image, it's an okay image. I think I can maybe make that sky a little bit better than it is right now, but it's not really a great photo either. So I'm not going to give it five stars because any photo that I give five stars to is an image I think is really good. So I may wanna give it four stars instead because it may have potential. So I'm just gonna press the number four key and that's going to add those four stars and advance to the next image. So I've already rated and tagged some of these. So I'm just gonna go through five star, five star. And then if I want to skip an image and maybe not reject or tag it yet, I can use my arrow keys to advance to the next images. All right, now let me show you what I do once everything is tagged. I'm gonna go back to my original folder here and we're going to go into the grid view by pressing the letter G and let's see if there are any rejected files in here. I can't remember if there is or not. No, so I'm gonna go ahead and just tag a couple of these, but just to show you real quick, what I would do is I would select all these files with command or control plus the letter A and then I'm going to hit the delete key or the backspace key if you're on a PC and then you're gonna get this window. Do you want to remove them from Lightroom? If you select that option, it will remove them from the Lightroom catalog, but keep those rejected files in the folder on your hard drive. But if you wanna get rid of them completely, you're going to use delete from disk. Now that's going to remove the files permanently. So they're gonna be put in the trash. So you have to decide what works best for you. For me, I know they're not good, so I would delete them from the disk. 
All right, so my next step for getting organized is to add keywords. So keywords are essential for finding specific images among tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of images through the library filter. So let's say I wanna find all the images in this catalog that were shot during sunrise. There we are. We have 30 images out of 2,214 in this catalog, and that's possible because I applied the keyword sunrise to these particular images. So that's the benefit of adding keywords. Personally, it's really difficult for me to add keywords or even get organized in general. It's just something that I have to work on, but the more I do it, the easier it becomes and it actually becomes a habit after a while. So let me share with you some tips on how you can make this easier and faster so you can then find those images later on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the library filter and I'm gonna go back into the Letchworth folder here and let's select this image here. So let's say we wanna add some keywords to this particular image. There's two different places where we can add keywords. One is the keyword list, which is going to list all the keywords used in the catalog, and then you can select that keyword from here to add that to the file. Now, that's not my preferred method. There's actually a quicker way, but this is pretty cool to see a list of all the keywords used and the number of times that keyword was used in the catalog. My preferred method is to use the keywording panel here, and this has three different options to add your keywords. So the first one is a keyword box, and then you can begin typing in whatever keyword you wanna add for that particular image. And then you're going to use the comma key to separate them. And then as you type, it's going to give you suggestions based on keywords that you've used previously. And then once you hit your enter key, that will continue adding that particular file. Okay, so that's one way of doing it one image at a time. Or what you can do is you can select multiple images and do it that way as well. Or you can also use the keyword suggestion. So Lightroom is going to provide nine different terms or keywords that you've used in the past that are similar to this particular image. And then you can just come in and click on these to add them to the keyword box up here. But again, if you have multiple images selected, then it will add those keywords to all those files. If you have multiple images that you have in the same location, same subject, you can do that with multiple images. Now, another quick way to add keywords is to use a keyword set. And this way, instead of using keyword suggestions provided by Lightroom, you can create your own keyword sets. So if I click right here, you'll see I have Point Pelee and Letchworth State Park. So haven't traveled a lot since I've created this particular catalog, but those were the two places that I've gone to the most. And I plan on going back to both of those locations in the future. So I created keyword sets to allow me to add keywords to those images that I create in the future. So Point Pelee is right down the street from me. It's like 10 minutes away. So what I can do is I can click on that and then I can click on each one of these keywords to add them into the keyword tags up here for that particular file or multiple files if I have multiple files selected. Now, if you choose a keyword by mistake, all you have to do is click on that keyword again to remove it from the keyword set or the keyword tags up here. Okay, so once I've completed adding keywords, I'll then edit the images and begin adding labels. So labels to me are a method of choosing images that I wanna do something with later on. For example, some images I'll want to post on Facebook, a few I may wanna print, and others I may wanna sell as a stock photo or maybe use in a calendar that I wanna create for the following year. And I'm going to use a different label for each scenario. So for me, the blue label represents images that will be posted on social media. Green are photos that I will print, which I've actually done for most of these images, and you can see some of them behind me. I also have a yellow label that represent images that have been completed or edited to perfection, and only the original raw files get this label. So the benefit of this is I can sort and find images without a label, which means I still have a lot of images to edit. 
Okay, so I've saved the best way to organize your images for last, which is using collections. So a collection is a virtual folder that will allow you to sort your images into these virtual folders and can be used to organize your images in various ways. So let me show you how these work. So if we scroll down here, we have a panel called collections and there's three different types of collections that you can create. You're gonna click right here to create your collections. And the first one is a basic collection where you need to manually add the images to. So you're just gonna click on create collection, give it a name, and then any selected photos will be added to this if you have this turned on. So if I click create, it will be added. And you can see down here, I have a Letchworth, which I just showed you earlier. I have a Point Peely calendar 2024 and a stock photos collections. So this is a great way to organize your images outside of the original folders. But my favorite type of collection is a smart collection. So if we look right here, we have create smart collection. And what this is going to allow you to do is create a custom variable or variables that will then tell Lightroom, okay, if this image has the following rules, then put it in this collection. So you can set any one of these items here as the first scenario or part of the rule and then is or is not. And then these different variables here will change based on what you select over here. So let me show you how this works. And for this catalog, I've created a print and social media smart collection. And the rules that I apply to these is based on a specific color label. And if I select a new image here and apply a blue color label, that will be added to the social media smart collection automatically. We have 19 images right now. Once I apply that blue label, it is added to that smart collection. How awesome is that? I love it. So this is a great way to organize your images even further into virtual folders by letting Lightroom do all the hard work based on the rules that you set up for that particular smart collection. Now, once you've organized all your images, you need to decide how to edit the images. So you're gonna learn some pro tips on how to use the develop module to edit your images, an overview of every editing tool in Lightroom Classic and more. And because of that, this tutorial is quite long. However, we can't go into every possible scenario and go into great detail about every editing tool. Otherwise, we would be here for hours and hours. So make sure to check out the links in the description to learn more about specific types of editing. And if you are ready, well, let's do it. All right, to get into the develop module, you can either come up here and click right here or press the letter D. Now, just like with the library module, we have a left and right panel and our film strip is down here at the bottom. All right, so since this is a Lightroom Classic editing tutorial for beginners, we're gonna skip all these panels right here except for presets since they're used to edit your images. So the question is, what is a preset? A preset is a saved set of photo editing settings in Lightroom that transforms your images with just a click of the preset. You then have the flexibility to adjust the settings that work best for that particular image and your creative vision. Now, Lightroom does come with some presets for free once you install Lightroom for the first time. I also have a bunch of presets here that I've created for myself and some of these are free as well. All you have to do is check out the link in the description to download around 150 presets and no email is required. So check out the link in the description below. All right, so let's go ahead and open up my retro collection right here. I'm also going to select this image that I shot at the Eloise Psychiatric Hospital in Michigan. And as I begin hovering over each image, it's going to show you what that edit is going to look like based on the settings that were saved in that preset. If we take a look at the basic panel here, we can see the edit settings that I've applied so far. And then once I click on a preset, those edit settings will be updated accordingly. I can go back with Command or Control plus the letter Z. And if I choose another preset, then those edit settings will be applied. Now I don't have to undo that. I can go ahead and click another one to update those settings accordingly based on that preset and the edit settings saved inside of it. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and check out the editing tools here in the right panel. And at the top, we have a visual representation of the luminance and color values of your image in the form of a histogram. So the histogram consists of five different parts of your image's tonal values, starting with the blacks on the left side, followed by the shadows, midtones, highlights, and whites. So the midtones is actually the exposure in Lightroom Classic. But if we take a look at the basic panel here, we can see in the tone section, we have exposure, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. And then we can use these to adjust the tonal values in our image based on what we need to do for that particular image. And we also have a contrast slider here. If you want to increase or decrease the contrast, you can do that with this contract slider here. Now, to learn more about the histogram, check out the video tutorial link in the description below. All right, so this particular image is extremely underexposed in the bottom two thirds of the image here. So I may want to increase the shadows and the blacks to bring out the detail in that part of the image. So I'm gonna go ahead and slide the shadows slider here to the right, and then that detail will be revealed in the shadows. I can do the same with the blacks to bring out more detail if I wanna do that. Now, if you're unsure where to start your editing, go ahead and click on this auto button right here, and Lightroom will use its AI technology to compare your image among tens of thousands of similar images and auto magically edit your image. Now, sometimes it will give a really good result, like for this particular image, and sometimes not so good. Either way, auto is a great place to start. Now, another thing you can do is you can create an HDR image among three different exposures, which I wanna show you right now. I'm gonna go ahead and undo this with Command or Control plus the letter Z. And we can see I have three different images here with three different exposures. So same scene, different exposures. Now I did that because I knew that the dynamic range of the scene was really high. And that's because in the gorge here, the sun wasn't shining any light inside of there. So in order to capture the details and the highlights, I had to expose for the highlights. And then I created another exposure to start showing the detail or capture that detail in the gorge. And then this one here shows the detail more than the other two, but the highlights are now blown out. Now we can take these three images once we have them selected. And if we go up to photo, photo merge and HDR, Lightroom will merge all the details from all three exposures and give you a high dynamic range image or HDR for short. Now I've already done this, so I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of this and we can see my HDR image here, which is very similar to the result that we got with the auto button here. So you can use either option depending on if you have multiple exposures or not. Either way, I would start with auto to get you started editing your image. Now, these edit settings that Lightroom provided after it created the HDR file are not the exact settings it gave me. I went in and I tweaked these settings based on my personal preference. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the histogram and let's go back into the basic panel here up at the top because we have a couple other things we haven't covered yet. We have treatment and next to that we have color and black and white so you can convert it to black and white or back to color if you change your mind. All right, so next we have one of the most overlooked edit settings in Lightroom Classic, which is your profile. Now, this is one of the first editing settings you should do before anything else. Now, in Lightroom Classic, a profile is used to interpret your raw file into the colors and the tones that you see. And that interpretation was created by someone else who says, your raw images colors should look like X and it should have an X amount of contrast. So in a way, profiles are like Lightroom presets. They both have editing information saved to it and will adjust your image based on those edit settings. Both profiles and presets are non-destructive as well. The difference between the two is you can change the edits applied via presets but not with profiles. So think of profiles as a starting point for your editing. Based on the profile, it applies a certain amount of contrast, color, saturation, and tonal adjustments. Now, if we click right here, you're gonna see the profiles provided by Adobe, but if you click on Browse, 
you will find camera matching profiles. So these are profiles created by the camera manufacturer based on your camera. And then you can hover over each one of these to see how that profile will affect your image. All right, so under that we have your white balance. In essence, the white balance is used to adjust the color of light in your image. Now with the white balance tools, you can remove color casts so that the whites, grays, and blacks are a pure color. For example, if there's a hint of yellow in the whites, blacks, or grays, that would be a yellow color cast. Now for this particular image, because it was shot at sunrise, it has that golden yellow color, which is a natural color in nature at this time of day, whether it's a sunrise or sunset. So we have our white balance eyedropper tool right here. And once you click on it, it will activate that tool for you. And this is going to allow you to click on any color and remove that color cast within that area. So if I hover over the clouds here, you can see that we have a creamy, brownish, yellowish tone to the pixels that I'm hovering over right now. Now also take a look at the percentages of those red, green, and blue numbers at the bottom of that grid. And you can see that the red is the dominant color, which is why it's warmer in that particular area. Now, once I click here, it's going to adjust the white balance. And now those percentages or those numbers are closer together. They're almost identical. And as you can see, the result, once that color cast is removed, the image is cooler or more blue or bluer, which is unnatural for this time of day. So we don't always want pure white in our images. It all depends on your particular image and whether or not you want to remove the color cast. Now for this one, I don't. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as is, which is this color temperature right here, 5200, which is what I captured in camera. Now, if you didn't capture the white balance that you wanted for a particular scene and you don't want pure white, you can adjust your temp from this slider here. So to the right, it will become more yellow, to the left, more blue. And then you can adjust the tint as well to add magenta or green to the image. We also have some pre-made white balance options inside of this menu here based on different lighting conditions. Now, this is only going to be visible if you shoot in RAW. All right, so the last section in the basic panel is your presence settings. So we have texture, clarity, and dehaze. And when you apply these, it's going to give the appearance that your image is sharper and it's going to target different elements or tones and details in your image depending on which one you use. And I have a separate video tutorial that goes into great detail on how to use all three. And you can find the link to that in the description below. Next, we have vibrance and saturation. So saturation is going to increase the purity of that color. And if you remove saturation, and once you go to minus 100, it's going to strip that color completely in every tonal range of your image. And I bring that up because vibrance is slightly different from saturation. It is going to boost the colors in the image, but if you go to minus 100, it's not 100% black and white. So it's still applying color in your midtones, your highlights and your shadows just a little bit. So it's applying the colors in a different range of tones versus saturation. All right, so our next editing tool is the tone curve, which is an advanced tool to precisely control the contrast in your image. Plus, you can also use it for removing color casts or adding them depending on your creative vision. Now, I did mention in the basic panel here, we do have a contrast slider, but that's more restrictive versus the tone curve. So the tone curve will allow you to apply the contrast specifically in different parts of your tonal range. So we have our blacks and shadows on the left, midtones in the middle, and then highlights and whites on the right. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do with the tone curve, and we're not gonna cover everything right now. I do have a complete guide on the tone curve that you can find the link to in the description below. All right, so to use the tone curve, you can click on that linear line and then drag it to curve that line. And then you can increase the brightness by dragging up or you can make your image darker by pulling it down. 
You can also add as many anchor points as you want to manipulate that linear line based on what you need to do for your particular edit. So if I click and drag this up, that's going to target the highlights. If I click and drag this one down, that one's going to target the shadows. Now I have what is known as an S curve, which is a popular type of tone curve that creates contrast in your image. The more you pull down or the bigger that curve, the more contrast you will create. I prefer a subtle amount of contrast, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull these back in. Now by default, if you take a look up here, this gray circle is the activated tool for the tone curve. So this is the luminance of values, and these are the RGB color channels that you can target with different adjustments to alter the colors in your image, and you can target those colors in specific parts of the tonal range by adding different anchor points. So now the color red is being added in the highlights. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and reset all of those back to the original, and we're gonna take a look at HSL now. So HSL stands for Hue, Saturation, and Luminance, and these will allow you to target eight different color channels to either change the color, which you can do with hue. So if I adjust the orange here, you can see that the colors are changing in the image. Saturation will change the purity of that color. And then luminance will increase the brightness of that color or make it darker. Now, the other thing I wanna point out is if you go into the basic panel and convert to black and white, the HSL settings have changed to black and white. So now you can target the eight different color channels for your black and white, and you can then increase or decrease the brightness of each of those different color channels, which will give you a much more custom creative type of black and white. And this is my preferred method of creating black and white images. All right, next we have the effects panel. And from here you have a few options for creating a vignette. So all of these sliders will help you customize that vignette based on your creative vision. Now, if you wanna create more of a vintage or retro type of effect, you can add some grain and increase the size and roughness with these sliders here. The next editing panel is the detail panel. And from here, you're going to sharpen your images and remove digital noise. So let me share with you some pro tips on how to use these so you don't over edit your images. Otherwise, if you do, you're going to degrade your image. So let's take a look at this photo of my daughter here. And I'm going to increase the sharpening to the maximum, which I don't recommend doing. I'm just doing this to show you what happens with sharpening when you apply it and how to target where that sharpening is going to be applied in your images. So you can also increase the intensity of the sharpening with radius and detail. And then masking will allow you to remove that sharpening in different parts of your image. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in here so we can take a look. So we can see that her skin is really grungy looking and the imperfections in her skin have been enhanced with sharpening. Now, of course, if I bring this down, it's not as bad, but I just wanna show you what happens with your masking tool. So if I slide this to the right, it's going to begin reducing that sharpening along the skin. Now it's easier to see when you hold down your Alt or Option key, and then when you click on the masking tool, it will turn white, and as you adjust to the right, black will be introduced, so anything in black is not receiving sharpening. So when we apply sharpening, we want it to be along the edges of detail that are important to the image. In this case, the skin, although important, it doesn't need to be sharpened because we don't want to enhance those imperfections. We wanna sharpen the eyelashes, the eyebrows and the hair in the image. Now, when it comes to landscape photos, you're going to want to apply this masking as well because we don't wanna sharpen the blue sky. Otherwise, we will increase the grain, the noise, and the digital artifacts will become more apparent in the sky when you begin sharpening something that doesn't need to be sharpened, like the sky or the skin. All right, so I'm gonna pick out another image so we can take a look at noise reduction. So this is a dark-eyed Junko that I captured later in the day, and it was a low light situation. And because of that, I had to use a high ISO of 5,000. And if I zoom in, you can see all that digital noise in the background here that kind of looks like grain, film grain. 
Now, if we take a look at the noise reduction section here, we have two types of noise that we can remove. Color noise is going to be color specs. Now, these are the default settings and it did a really good job of removing that color noise. If I set this back to zero, you'll see that color noise as colored specs. So depending on your camera, these default settings may or may not work. If not, you can increase or decrease the amount to reduce the color as needed for your particular camera. Now, luminance noise is going to get rid of this grain that's in the background. So as we adjust to the right, it will begin smoothing out that grain or that noise and that will give the appearance that it's gone, but it's not going to always get rid of it 100%. The further to the right you go, it creates another problem, which is you begin to lose detail. So if I set this back to zero, you can see we have a lot of details in the feathers, but the further right I go, the more of those details are lost. Now by default, detail is set to 50, and you can increase the detail and contrast sliders here to try and bring back some of that detail. But the problem is, it's going to begin bringing back some of that luminous noise and also create digital artifacts. So there's a better way to remove digital noise in Lightroom, and I've created a video tutorial that you can find in the description below. So check out that video tutorial via the link that I've provided. All right, next we have lens correction. So let's go to another image here again. And this time I have a photo of a bridge. This is Brant Street Pier in Burlington, Ontario, which I took a few months ago. And we are going to take a look at lens correction and transform for this particular image. So I already have the remove chromatic aberrations and enable profile corrections activated, which is going to remove lens distortions and chromatic aberrations. So all you have to do is turn this on. It's not really gonna show in here because there's not any chromatic aberrations, but there is some lens distortions in here. So the lens distortions that it's going to fix are barrel distortions, which is going to distort the edges and mostly the corners of your image. And it's going to create a vignette in the corner. So if I turn this off, you will see that the corners are not as dark when it's turned on. And when it's turned off, it's much darker. Plus, if you take a closer look at the corners as I turn this on and off, you're gonna see that the corners are expanding or the image is expanding into the corner. So that's fixing that barrel distortion. Now, because I'm using a raw file, Lightroom is able to determine the make and model of the lens used and then it has a pre-built profile that will fix that distortion. Now, if it's not fixing it exactly the way you want, you can use the distortion and vignetting sliders right here. And if you're shooting in JPEG, you're not gonna have this option, so you'll have to do it manually. Okay, so color grading is a more advanced type of color editor that will allow you to target your colors in your tones and the shadows and the highlights and the midtones. So these can be used for creative purposes, cinematic effects, or removing color casts that you couldn't do with the white balance adjustment. So this is a more targeted type of color adjustment for precise colors. All right, so the other thing I wanna show you with this particular image is the transform panel. So this is going to fix some additional distortions that can happen with wide angle lenses, especially when shooting architecture with straight lines or any other type of man-made objects that have a straight line. Now, if I turn this off, because I've already applied my adjustments here, you're gonna see that the pillar is leaning here and we want to straighten that out. And we can do that with our transform tools here. I always start with auto because that usually gives me a good place to start. And then I will adjust these sliders here to further refine the adjustment. All right, so the final editing panel in here is the calibration panel. Now, this is another advanced color editing tool that provides precise micro adjustment controls over the colors of your raw files. So these sliders allow you to change the mixture of red, green, and blue within each pixel to something that provides a better result based on the lighting conditions of your image 
or it can be used creatively based on your creative vision. So you're gonna have to play around with these to find out if these are tools that you wanna use for editing the colors in your image. And then at the top here, we have a process that shows versions one through five. So version one is the tools and features and algorithms that we had available in Lightroom One back in 2007. And if you click on it, you're gonna notice in the basic panel here that the sliders here are different versus version one. So if you ever have any problems and you're not seeing the correct tools, make sure you have version five selected. All right, so there's one more thing I wanna mention before we move on to the editing tools and the toolbar here, and that is these panels here, these editing panels are considered global editing tools, and these are considered local adjustment tools. So you'll be able to target your image with these local adjustment tools to precisely control where the edits are applied, whereas these in general are going to target more of the image, of course, depending on the tool selected. So let's take a look at these local adjustment tools next. Now this first icon here, that's not really a tool. If I go ahead and turn on my crop tool here and then click on this, it's going to deactivate that tool, but it's not really necessary because you can click on your escape key to deactivate that tool as well. All right, let's take a closer look at the crop tool next. All right, so the crop tool comes with a variety of features and tools to help you crop and straighten your images. Now, the other thing we have with the crop tool are overlays, and the overlay that you're seeing is probably different than what I'm showing you right now on my image. And we have overlays that are based on different composition rules, this one being the rule of thirds. Now, to cycle through the list of different overlays, press the letter O, and that will reveal the next overlay in the list. Now, this particular overlay here is going to show you how your image is going to be cropped based on the aspect ratio selected. So right now I have original, which is this outer box or outer rectangle right here. So that's four by six or eight by 12. If I choose a different aspect ratio inside of this menu here, let's say five by seven, that would be this box right here. Let's go back to the original so you can see that. So we have the five by seven right here, or 11 by 14, and then four by five is also eight by 10. So if I do eight by 10, it will then show me the crop for that particular aspect ratio. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing your aspect ratio, because it's going to crop out parts of your image based on the ratio selected. Now to crop your image, you're just gonna grab a corner or a side or both to crop in tighter. And then you can click in the center here to recompose your image as needed. And if you click on the outside here, you can rotate your image if your image is crooked, but I prefer this little angle tool right here. We also have a slider, but if you click on this angle tool, it looks like a ruler. You can click on the horizon, drag out to match the angle of the horizon, and then it will automatically straighten it out for you. Now, once you have it cropped exactly the way you want, click enter or return. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that because I preferred my other crop. Our next local adjustment tool is right under this icon here. It kind of looks like a Band-Aid. And these tools here are used for retouching your images. Now, because we have these advanced editing tools in Lightroom, I can now do 95% of my editing or my retouching in Lightroom versus Photoshop. So we have three tools that are available in Photoshop as well but it's nice to have them in Lightroom. So we have our content aware brush, a healing brush and a clone stamp brush. Now, although we get the same results as we do in Photoshop, they work a little bit differently in Lightroom. So if you wanna learn how to get the most out of these tools, check out the video tutorial that I created via the link in the description. All right, so next to that, we have our red eye tool and I need to select this image here that I found online because I didn't have an image with the red eye here. So red eye correction is going to fix this red that happens when you use direct flash when you're taking photos of people and animals or pets. And for your pets, it's going to be green in color instead of red. So if you're photographing a pet with direct flash and you have that green color, make sure you select pet eye from here. We're gonna select red eye because this is a human after all. And then all we have to do is click and drag around that red color and Lightroom will automatically remove the red eye. All right, I'm gonna go back to this photo of my daughter here. 
And our last set of editing tools is inside of this circle here. These are the AI masking tools. So these masking tools are a way to make a selection of something in your image that you want to target and edit to. So subject is going to select a subject and it's going to select the entire subject. I'm going to go ahead and undo that because if you take a look down here, we have another option. And when I click on that, it's then going to separate different parts of the person into different masks. Once you click on create mask, how cool is that? It's awesome if you ask me because now I can go in and apply edits based on this new editing panel we have here to just her hair. If it's maybe too dark, I can brighten it up. I can add some contrast down here in presence to add a little bit of sharpening to that part of my person, my daughter. So that's a pretty cool option for editing your portraits. Now we also have a tool here to create a mask for the sky. So it will auto magically select the sky and then you can go in and make adjustments to that sky according to your creative vision. Another awesome masking tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that mask. And the other one we have here is background. So it's not going to work on that one because there's not a definitive background, but for this one, there is actually, let's take a look at this hummingbird here. And if I select background, it will auto magically select that background for me. And now I can go in and darken up that background to help that hummingbird stand out a little bit more. Now there are additional masking tools inside of here as well. We can select objects. We can use a brush for more precise control over where that mask is being applied. We have a linear gradient, also a radial gradient and then you can make a mask based on a specific color range based on the eyedropper tool and clicking on that area will then select those colors that you clicked on and you can also make a mask with a luminance range or a range of brightness levels. All right, so there's a whole lot more to learn about all of these masking tools. We haven't even scratched the surface yet, so make sure to check out the playlist in the description below to learn more about these masking tools. Now, once you've completed your editing, it's time to share your photos with the world, and that's going to require you to get the images out of Lightroom, which can be done with the exporting feature of Lightroom Classic. Not only will you learn how to export, but also how to create presets for exporting different size images and other attributes. So if you're ready, let's do it. All right, so the first thing we need to do is tell Lightroom which photos need to be exported. So I'm going to select my first image here. I'm gonna hold down my shift key and select the last image that I want included in the export or use command or control plus the letter A to select them all. Now we can go up to file and export from this top option right here. But let's talk about these other three export options real quick. Export with previous will export with the attributes that you applied on your last export. Export with preset will allow you to export via one of your user presets, which I'll show you how to create once we get into that part of this video tutorial. And you can see I have three different presets. I also export to PNG or via that file format. And I'll explain why that is in just a moment. There's also some pre-made presets by Lightroom and then I have some from Luminar Neo as well. And then export as catalog will allow you to export all the files selected as a catalog. So let's say you have two or more catalogs and you wanna merge those catalogs into one. Well, you're gonna select all your images and then export it as a catalog. And then to merge them, you're gonna come up here and select import from another catalog. Once you select that catalog from here, you will then have that catalog merged into the current catalog that is open. All right, let's go into the export dialog window. And there's a lot of options right here that you can apply to your export or things that you can do during the export process. So we're gonna go over these as well as the presets over here in how to create a preset and why you would want to do that. So the first thing we need to do is tell Lightroom 
where to export the file. So you can export to a specific folder from here, or you can choose your folder from this button. You can also place it into a subfolder. Now, when you export your files, they're not included in the catalog. So you're gonna export them as a JPEG, PNG file, PSD file, TIFF file, whatever file format you want, but that file that is created during the export is not included in the catalog. So if you wanna include them in the catalog, you're gonna add to this catalog with this option here. And then you have some options here to tell Lightroom what to do based on different situations in case you're exporting to the same folder over and over again, you wanna make sure you're not overwriting any existing files in that location. Now, you do have the option here to rename your file if that's something you wanna do during the export process. Personally, I like to rename my files in Lightroom, not during the export process. So in that case, the exported file, as you can see right here, will get this file format. So it's going to retain the same file naming structure that I have in Lightroom with that file format, whatever I choose in the file settings down here. So we also have options for video. We're not doing videos. So let's take a look at our file settings. So from here, you can select your different file formats. So if I'm posting my images on my blog, I'm going to choose a JPEG file. But if I'm posting my images on social media, I'm going to choose PNG. And the reason why is when you upload to Facebook, Instagram, whatever the case may be, they're compressing your file a lot and it's going to degrade your image. I find that PNG files retain more of the detail and it's of a higher quality after the compression. So I recommend PNG file for social media. Now with JPEG files, you have the quality options here. So I would recommend a minimum of 80 up to 100 to retain the highest quality possible for your JPEG files. Now, the reason you would wanna go down to 80 is because you want a smaller file. Now, if I'm posting on my website, I will use a quality of 80 to have a smaller file size versus 100. But we can also limit the file size to a specific size from here. Now, the other option you have here is your color space. So if you're printing your images at home or at a vendor of your choice, you're going to need to refer to them or your printer manual to find out what color space to use. If you're posting online, you're gonna use sRGB. All right, next we have to tell Lightroom the size of the file. If you want to retain the original file size and resolution, then you want to keep this turned off. If you want to resize to fit based on these options here, then you will type in the width or the height based on what you need for width and height. And if you select dimensions or one of these other options, you'll get different options. Now, if I'm posting to my blog, I'm going to do a width of 1000 for the maximum size with a resolution of 72. And then for Facebook, I will do a maximum of 1800 for horizontal images and 1000 for vertical images. So that's what I have set up in my presets here. If I click on horizontal, we have 1800 for the width. Vertical, I have a height of 1000. So not a width of 1000, but a height of 1000. And then again, we want a resolution of 72 for online, whether it's social media or your blog. Print is gonna be 240 or 300, depending on what's required of your in-home printer or the vendor of your choice. So again, you'll need to refer to them on what to use for the resolution, whether it's 240 or 300. Next, we have output sharpening. So you can output for different scenarios here, depending on what you need and then you can adjust the amount from here. Now, personally, I prefer to sharpen my images in Lightroom and not during the export process. Now, we have some options here for metadata. You can include all metadata or choose from one of these other options here. Now, I like to do all metadata, except for I will turn on remove person info and that will remove personal information as well as remove local information. That way, 
you're not providing information to anybody about where that photo was taken, which is really good if you're taking photos of your kid in your backyard and there's geodata on that file or in the metadata, people can look up where you live. So you may want to remove that information from your file so nobody knows where you live. And then we have an option to add a watermark. So you can include your logo here or a simple copyright watermark. And if you click on edit watermarks, you're gonna get this new window here where you can include a graphic or if you wanna do a text-based watermark, you can type in right here that information and then you have some options here to adjust the font type, the style, the alignment, and some other options here. If we scroll down, there's additional options here as well for adjusting your watermark as well as the position from here. Now, what you can do is you can create a preset of this watermark so you don't have to come back in here and keep doing it over and over again. So I have my brand top right and bottom left for my graphic or my brand. And then you can click on save current settings as a new preset to create your own preset. All right, so the last option is post processing. You need to tell Lightroom what to do after export. You can simply have Lightroom do nothing or maybe you want to see those files in the finder window or the operating system folder that they have been exported to and then that window will pop up to show you those files or you can open them up into an application. All right, so once you've done that, you may want to save it as a preset because you may have multiple reasons to export your files. Like for myself, I have my blog, I have Facebook, I have a gallery on 500px, and all of those are going to require different attributes during the export process. So instead of coming in here and readjusting all of these, all we have to do is click on add, give it a name, click create, and then that will create a preset for you. And then all you have to do is click export to export those files according to those attributes. All right, to continue elevating your Lightroom Classic editing skills, make sure to check out that playlist for some Lightroom Classic quick tips or this Lightroom Classic editing playlist for pro tips on editing your images in Lightroom Classic. Thanks for watching and have an awesome day.